So another interesting hypothesis is the superposition hypothesis. Can you describe what superposition is? Yeah. So earlier we were talking about word to fact, right? And we were talking about how, you know, maybe you have one direction that corresponds to gender and maybe another that corresponds to royalty and another one that corresponds to Italy and another one that corresponds to, you know, food and and all of these things. Well, you know, um, oftentimes maybe these, these, uh, these word embeddings, they might be 500 dimensions, 1,000 dimensions. And so if you believe that all of those directions were orthogonal, um, then you could only have, you know, 500 concepts. And, you know, I, I love pizza. Um, but like, if I was going to go and like, give the like 500 most important concepts in, um, you know, the English language, probably Italy wouldn't be, it's not obvious at least that Italy would be one of them, right? Because you, you have to have things like plural and singular and uh, uh, verb and noun and adjective. And, you know, um, there's, a, there's a lot of things we have to get to before we get to get to Italy. Um uh, and Japan, and you know, there's a lot of countries in the world. Um, and so how might it be that models could, you know, simultaneously have the linear representation hypothesis be true, and also represent more things than they have directions? So so what does that mean? Well, okay, so if, if, if the linear representation hypothesis is true, something interesting has to be going on. Now, I'll, I'll tell you one more interesting thing before we, we go and we do that, which is, um, you know, we were, earlier we were talking about all these polysemantic neurons, right? Um, these neurons that, you know, when we were looking at Inception V1, there's these nice neurons that, like, the car detector and the curve detector and so on that respond to lots of, you know, to very coherent things. But it's lots of neurons that respond to a bunch of unrelated things. And that's, that's also an interesting phenomenon. Um, and it turns out as well um, that even these neurons that are really, really clean, if you look at the weak activations, right? So if you look at, like, you know, the activations where it's, like, activating 5% of, of the the the, you know, of the maximum activation. It's really not the core thing that it's expecting, right? So if you look at a, a curve detector, for instance, and you look at the places where it's 5% active, you know, you could interpret it just as noise, or it could be that it's that it's doing something else there. Okay, so, so how could that be? Well, there's this amazing thing in mathematics. Um, called compressed sensing. And it's it's actually this, this very surprising fact where if you have a high-dimensional space and you project it into a low-dimensional space, ordinarily, you can't go and sort of unproject it and get back your high-dimensional vector, right? You threw information away. This is like, you know, you can't, you can't invert a rectangular matrix. Um, you can only invert square matrices. Um, but it turns out that that's actually not quite true. If I tell you that the high dimensional vector was sparse, so it's mostly zeros, then it turns out that you can often go and find back um, the uh, the high dimensional vector with with very high probability. Um, so that's a surprising fact, right? It says that you know you can um, you can you can have this high dimensional vector space, and as long as things are sparse, um, you can project it down. You can have a lower dimensional projection of it, and that works. So the superposition hypothesis is saying that that's what's going on in neural networks. That's, for instance, that's what's going on in word embeddings. The word embeddings are able to simultaneously have directions be the meaningful thing. And by exploiting the fact that they're, they're operating on a fairly high dimensional space, they're actually, and, and the fact that these concepts are sparse, right? Like, you know, you usually aren't talking about Japan and Italy at the same time. Um, you know, most of, the, most of those concepts, you know, in most sentences, Japan and Italy are both zero. They're not present at all. Um, and if that's true, um, then you can go and have it be the case that um, that you can you can have many more of these sort of directions that are meaningful, these features, than you have dimensions. And similarly, when we're talking about neurons, you can have many more concepts than you have have neurons. So that's the at a high level the superstition hypothesis. Now it has this even wilder implication, which is um, to go and say that uh, neural networks are. It may not just be the case that the, the representations are like this, but the, the computation may also be like this, you know, the connections between all of them. And so in, in some sense, neural networks may be shadows of much larger, sparser neural networks. And what we see are these projections. Um, and the super, you know, the strongest version of the superstition hypothesis would be to take that really seriously and sort of say, you know, there, there actually is in some sense this, this upstairs model, this, you know, um, where, where the neurons are really sparse and all interpretable and there's, you know, the weights between them are these really sparse circuits. And that's what we're studying. Um, and uh, the thing that we're observing is the shadow of it. And so we need to find the original object. And uh, the process of learning is trying to construct a compression of the upstairs model 
that doesn't lose too much information in the projection. Yeah, it's finding how to fit it efficiently or something like this. Um, the gradient descent is doing this. And in fact, so this sort of says that gradient descent, you know, it could, it could just represent a dense neural network, but it sort of says that gradient descent is implicitly searching over the space of extremely sparse models that could be projected into this low dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And this large body of work of, of people going and trying to study sparse neural networks, right? Where you go and you have, you, you could design neural networks, right? Where, where the edges are sparse and the activations are sparse. And, you know, my sense is that work has generally, it, it feels very principled, right? It, it makes so much sense. And yet that, that work hasn't really panned out that well, is my impression broadly. And I think that a, a, a potential answer for that is that actually the neural network is already sparse in some sense. Gradient descent was the whole time gradient. You were trying to go and do this. Gradient descent was actually in the behind the scenes, going and searching more efficiently than you could through the space of sparse models and going and learning whatever sparse model was most efficient, and then figuring out how to fold it down nicely to go and run conveniently on your GPU, which does you know as nice dense matrix multiplies, mm -hmm. um, and that you just can't beat that. How many concepts do you think can be shoved in, in, into a neural network? Depends on how sparse they are. So there's there's probably an upper bound from the number of parameters, right? Because you have to have you, you still have to have you know param weights that go and connect them together. Um, so that's that's one upper bound. There are in fact all these lovely results from compressed sensing and the Johnson Linton Strauss lemma and, and things like this um, that they they basically tell you that if you have a, a vector space and you want to have almost orthogonal vectors, which is sort of the, probably the thing that you want here, right? So you, you're you going to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to give up on having my, my concepts, my features be strictly orthogonal, but I'd like them to not interfere that much. I'm going to have to ask them to be almost orthogonal. Um, then this would say that it's actually, you know, for once you set a threshold for, for what, you're, what you're willing to accept in terms of how, how much cosine similarity there is, that's actually exponential in the number of neurons that you have. So at some point, that's not going to even be the, the limiting factor. Um, but um, yeah, there's some beautiful results there. And in fact, it's probably even better than that in some sense, because that's sort of a, for saying that, you know, any random set of features could be active. But in fact, the features have sort of a correlational structure where some features, you know, more, are more likely to co-occur and other ones are less likely to co-occur. And so neural networks, my guess would be, can do, do very well in terms of going and uh, packing things in such to, to the point that that's probably, probably not the limiting factor.